My name is Tracy Milligan. I'll be talking to you today about mentoring. And um, I just want to thank the organizers of this for inviting me to speak. And a special thanks to Angela O'Neill, my friend and colleague. I am just going to silence that bell. And um, so I work at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And in my work, I'm fortunate to be able to mentor people and it's something that I really enjoy. So I put together some information about mentorship from the literature and then I'm also happy to share my opinions and my experiences and my hope is that this will be a forum for us to continue to share our own experiences, questions, advice for each other and that this webinar can serve as a platform to start doing that today. But I do know that a lot of this happens already um, through various um, Facebook groups and organizations. Um, so let me go ahead and get started on win at mentoring. And I'm going to share eight principles and tips for an effective mentoring relationship. So I wanted to start by just sharing a little bit about the historical significance of the word mentor. And the term mentor um, was has its roots in uh, actually the Odyssey from Homer's Greek epic. And so in this myth, Odysseus um, had been off fighting the Trojan War, and he entrusted the care of his son um, to Telemachus, um, his son Telemachus, to his friend and advisor named Mentor. So Mentor was also charged with serving as a guardian to the entire royal household in Odysseus' absence. And as the story unfolds, Mentor guides Telemachus and accompanies him on a journey in search of his father. Ultimately, Mentor became the guiding force in his son's full development. And so since that time, the word Mentor has become synony synonymous with wise teacher, guide, philosopher, friend, advisor, and sponsor. So let's go through some of uh, eight principles and tips. So tip number one is really to think about defining a mentoring relationship. And as I go through this presentation, I'm just sharing some quotes as we go through the different tips. So our first quote, the greatest good you can do for another is not just to share your riches, but to reveal to him his own. So let's start with a definition of a mentoring relationship. And I purposely have less, left this slide incomplete because one um, activity is to actually think of how you would fill in those blanks here. So mentoring is a dynamic and what sort of relationship? In which a mentor and mentee agree to a partnership and work, how are they going to work? To achieve mutually defined goals to facilitate a mentee's professional and what else? So um, just thinking to yourself, how might you fill this in? And these, um, this is our mentoring relationship. So um, the mentoring is a dynamic and reciprocal relationship in which a mentor and mentee agree to a partnership and work collaboratively to achieve mutually defined goals to facilitate a mentee's professional growth and success. Mentoring occurs when an experienced, trusted, professional colleague offers per personal expertise and advice to facilitate a less experienced person's professional growth and success. The mentor often helps the mentee establish a broader network of contacts and connections within the field and shares experience based on wisdom about the profession. On the basis of that broad definition of mentoring, it is clear that many people encounter during the life of a professional do some aspects of mentoring, but may not fit the technical definition of mentor. Now, back in 2006, there was a study um, which was really a review of mentoring in academic medicine. And in that review, they reviewed 42 articles and looked at the goal of mentorship, its prevalence, and its effect on career development. And they found that mentorship was um, felt to have a very important influence on personal development, career guidance, and research productivity in academia, but that women do have more difficulty finding a mentor. So what can help mentorship work better? 
having a mentor that's available um, and has expertise um, is able to develop a supportive relationship. There's, there's a mutuality in the relationship and responsiveness. And lack of mentoring leads to decreased job satisfaction, um, decreased career development, and decreased academic productivity. So we know from the literature that women in academics um, need access to experienced and well-connected mentors with common interests who are committed to helping them advance their career. Um, there was another study that was done with fourth year medical students. And I just highlight this study because it has a nice table looking at how fourth year medical students um, looked at the perceived barriers in medical education and they stratified them by gender. Um, there were some also, also some tables that looked at the difference um, between whites and underrepresented minorities. But I show this um, so we can look at the difference between men and women. And we can see that there were significant differences in women having a higher fear of failure, um, a barrier of having uh, not as much of a support network, lack of same-sex role models, lack of a mentor, and lack of a same-sex mentor. And this, in, this um, information has been replicated in other studies looking at um, groups of attending physicians. So I think this is a really wonderful thing that we're focused on is to think about women mentoring women. And we know that there's a need for it. So we want to learn to be an effective mentor. Um, and here's our second quote. So the mediocre mentor tells, the good mentor explains, the superior mentor demonstrates, and the greatest mentors inspire. So how can we be an effective mentor? Well, there's some very basic do's and don'ts. Um, do be available and be an active listener. Ask questions rather than problem solve. Track progress, give feedback, and be flexible to the needs of the mentee. And some don'ts, don't promote your own agenda and don't take credit. And, you know, I, I really enjoy mentoring. I try to be an effective mentor and do my uh, best. But I can tell you I've definitely made mistakes. And one of the mistakes um, that I can think of is when I really felt like I had some great advice to give my mentee and um, who was in a bit of a crisis. And so I shared my opinion rather than helping um, that mentee explore um, to themselves what they thought was right. And, you know, my opinion was actually wrong, it turns out. So I think that active listening part of it um, is a really key part of it and not promoting um, your own agenda. I know that's something that I personally have to keep in mind. So qualities and skills of effective mentors. Effective mentors, first of all, they have some knowledge um, to share. Um, they have the personal skills of listening, motivating, influencing, helping discover those facts, counseling, time management, professional development. They have qualities of being able to open doors, um, the quality of willingness, commitment, enthusiasm, and confidentiality and they have experience. But there are different ways to mentor. Um, when we think about how to be an effective mentor, there's not any one style. Uh, there are some different styles of mentorship. And so this is uh, sort of three different styles. And I think if you think about your own experiences in life, you may find that you've experienced these different styles of mentorship yourself. We have the guide who has um, hands-on guidance it has uh, explaining the how and why, creating opportunities to learn. The challenger who sort of makes waves is challenging, stimulating, questioning, probing, maybe makes us stretch a little bit more than we were anticipating. And the role model, um, not all our role models know that they're actually our role models. They're unseen, um, maybe unfelt, and we unconsciously adopt aspects of that mentor's thinking behaviors and or style. Here's another description of some uh, five common methods of mentoring. And um, accompanying, sowing, catalyzing, showing, and harvesting. So the accompanying mentor makes a commitment in a caring way 
and that involves taking part in the learning process side by side with the learner. The sewing mentor, um, sometimes our mentee is not quite ready for what we have, um, what we would like to say to them. Um, I think about my ch children a lot when I think about the sewing type of mentorship. So we're preparing the, the mentee um, before they're necessarily ready to change. And that's necessary when you know what you say may not be understood or um, acceptable to your mentee at first, but maybe it will make sense and have value to the mentee when the situation requires it. Um, yeah, we have to be careful with this. Uh, you know, we want to, it's easiest to, to share things when um, the, the learner or the mentee is, is ready for it. But sometimes the sewing is sort of the eat your broccoli part of it. You know that it's, it has a high potential to be good for them later. Um, catalyzing, and the catalyzing method of mentoring is when there's sort of this critical level of pressure and um, the mentor chooses to plunge the, the mentee right into change, provoking a different way of thinking, a change in identity, or a reordering of values. Um, this may be catalyzing um, something that somebody's not aware that they, that, um, that they needed that help with, take, making use of, of a situation to help induce some change. Showing is making something understandable, using your own example, demonstrating a skill or activity. You show what you're talking about, you show by your own behavior. And harvesting, is that's when you're picking the right, right fruit. It's used to create awareness of what was learned by experience and draw conclusions. It's the what have you learned part of mentoring. There are different questioning styles that mentors can use as well. And I think it's good to think about building our um, expertise in how we ask questions, how we probe and do active listening. So we can ask challenging questions to um, unfreeze assumptions, values or beliefs, probing questions, which are more assertive, opening horizons, creating insight, confirming questions, building upon our mentees' values and beliefs, and testing, um, drawing together, setting boundaries, creating confidence. Um, so we can use this wide range of questioning styles to help the mentee with their own self-reflection. But um, as we talk about mentoring, I also just want to mention um, a lot of times we talk about uh, coaching and um, sponsorship too. And this is, a, this is an article that I sent off to my department chair when it came out because I think that um, mentorship, I agree with the title, mentorship is not enough. And when it comes to career advancement and career development in academics, women benefit from having sponsorship. And so what is the difference between um, being a mentor and a sponsor? And this figure is, is from this recently published paper. And um, you can see sort of how there is some overlap in mentorship and sponsorship, but some differences as well. So where um, the mentorship is focused on career development, the sponsorship is focused on career advancement. And the mentorship might be more of a longitudinal relationship where the sponsorship relationship is uh, focused on something specific and is very transactional, episodic, and um, it can be very critical, especially later in the career. So what's the difference between a coach, a mentor, and a sponsor? And I heard this recently, I, I thought it was sort of an easier way to sort of conceptualize it. A coach is somebody who speaks to. A mentor is somebody who speaks with. And a sponsor is somebody who speaks for. And so with coaches, they're helping us with a specific skill, speaking to us about that skill. The mentor is doing active listening, participating in this relationship, and um, speaking with. Whereas the sponsor is helping promote somebody, give them specific opportunities, and is speaking for you. So the most valuable mentors are often the sponsors. Um, and this just summarizes a bit of what I have already mentioned, that sponsorship is episodic, focused on specific opportunities. Effective sponsors are a career established, they're well-connected, sort of our talent scouts, and they have access, network access. 
Their effective um, mentees or protégés rise to the task and remain loyal. Successful sponsorship relationships are based on trust, respect, mutual benefits, and understanding potential risks. And sponsorship is critical to career advancement. So I think that's something to, to keep in mind um, to look for those opportunities that we have to sponsor people, but also to recognize that it is um, different than mentorship. I have just one slide of millennials. Um, some of us listening may be millennials and some of us are not. So and there's a, a whole lot being said about what millennials want. So I thought this was just sort of a nice slide to keep in mind. Um, and this is um, from the Harvard Business School Review. So top five characteristics millennials want in a boss. Will help me navigate my career path, will give me straight feedback, will mentor and coach me, will sponsor me for formal development programs, and is comfortable with flexible um, schedules. So um, I, one thing I have noticed is really this interest in getting feedback, and we'll talk about that um, later in the presentation in our mentoring relationship, making sure to build feedback into it. So our third tip um, for uh, effective mentoring is the mentee is in charge. And this is a, is a great quote from Buddha. When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. So the mentee needs to be an active participant and really to get the most out of an effective mentoring relationship, it requires a lot of self-reflection on the part of the mentee. And as mentors, that's something that we can help our mentees with is that self-reflection um, component. The mentee does best when they're goal-oriented and realistic about what they would like to get out of the mentoring relationship. And again, the mentee is in charge. Um, the mentee sets the agenda. And these are a couple of tips that came from this reference I have at the bottom of the slide, that the mentee can email a short summary of what they want to get out of the session to the mentor at least 24 hours in advance. And then after the meeting, prepare a summary detailing the main issue discussed, key discoveries, learning, and agreed actions. And this is just one example of how to put some organization and structure into a mentoring relationship. Um, I uh, have learned this from um, doing my research uh, in preparation for this talk. And I have to say, I thought that the idea of the mentee emailing ahead of time and saying what they wanted to get out of the session would really help me a lot as a mentor, I think. And so I plan on trying this out, although I haven't done it in the past, um, because there is so much that could be discussed often when we meet with our mentees. And if we have a little bit of notice, it can help us really think about how to make most use of that meeting. Um, this is from a workshop that is on MedEd Portal about um, how to uh, create a mentee-driven relationship. And so they outline three steps to a mentee-driven relationship. One, figure out what you need as a mentee. Two, identify a mentor that will match your needs. And three, develop character qualities of successful mentees. So figure out what you need as a mentee. This is something that mentees can do on their own or um, perhaps with their mentor uh, as the relationship is beginning. So if we think about what are some needs that the mentee might need for professional development, such as career advancement interventions, and then in personal development, social and psychosocial support. I think this is something that really we, we can all really think about um, what our needs are. And here's just an example of some things that people often find that professional development, it may be for a job search, career guidance, help with preparing a CV, negotiation skills. I think these are all topics that come up frequently when groups of women um, uh, professionals gather together. Um, perhaps it's a scholarly project or um, a, a achieving a, a certain level of skill in research or writing, um, promotion, networking skills, again, looking for that sponsorship, um, looking for an advocate, and navigating the institution if you're in the same um, institution. I think that can be really helpful. And then these are also um, on their personal development, I think things that 
come up very frequently too when professional women gather together is this work-life integration and balance, time management, organizational skills, um, conflict management skills, communication skills, and um, specific gender diversity topics. And sometimes it's um, you, you don't even realize that, that there are things people can help you with until you really provide what your challenges are and um, explore that with a mentor. So another step in identifying your needs as a mentee is thinking about how a mentor can help you. What do I need and why do I need it? And um, really setting some goals for yourself as a, as a mentee in the mentoring relationship. And then again, as a mentor, if our mentees haven't done this, we can help them explore this further. So common answers, what do I need, advice, a safe haven, um, a sounding board, a kick in the pants. I know I, I've definitely needed that myself as a mentee, and an advocate. And then why do I need it? Um, get my current position, to challenge myself, to learn a specific skill, to develop myself as a leader, to prepare me for my next career move. All very common needs. Another um, activity that we can consider doing in our mentor-mentee relationship is exploring um, as a mentee what network um, needs there are. And uh, as you know, for all of us in life, we don't have just one mentor. We have many mentors and mentors that help us in different aspects of our life. So this, I, I thought, is a really nice way of diagramming that, is to think about, um, as the mentee, what are my priorities um, and who are my mentors in helping me with those priorities and where, where might I need to fill in some of those gaps? Um, where, what are my, um, really, the, the opportunities that I, I need to explore further and where do I already have really effective um, helpful mentorship. I think this just helps um, the mentee outline what they have and what they might need to look for. And then based on the literature and looking at developing the character qualities of successful mentees, um, these are what character qualities successful mentees have. So really that ability to manage up, to proactively take initiative, to drive the relationship, drive the partnership, the self-assessment, self-monitoring, respect of the mentor's time, that comfort in asking for assistance, openness to hearing new ideas and perspectives, receptive to constructive feedback, and to act with integrity, honest, and trustworthy, show appreciation and gratitude, and have the passion to succeed. And um, when we think about actually working with anybody, when they have those qualities, they're, they're much um, easier to work with, and I think they do obtain more out of that professional relationship. So what does mentorship um, help with? Um, how does the mentorship help the mentee? So uh, our next quote, mentoring is a brain to pick, an ear to listen, and a push in the right direction. So this was a recently published article that looked at um, a, an overview um, of benefits, barriers, and enablers in mental mentoring in female health academics. And here is just to show you, I, I know that it's small, but really just to show you how many different studies the authors looked at, and in the studies, what was found to be a benefit to the mentees. Um, and it's all things that we've already mentioned, sort of that career development, professional development, um, and uh, the, um, the factors that help with the overall relationship. But also they found in the review of the literature that there are these barriers of um, interpersonal dynamics and organizational factors. So just something to be aware of. Um, again, from a review of the literature, what are some of the benefits um, from different studies? So we know that women who are mentored are more successful in academics. They have more publications, they have more grants, 
um, they do better at um, getting promotion, things that, that we really need to, to foster. Um, and that there's also this um, heightened career satisfaction, lower feelings of isolation, and a greater sense of fit. So there are many avenues to be mentored, but I think that this um, also highlights how important in our workplace, it's important to have mentorship um, within our own workplace for each other. The mentoring also helps the mentor. The positive thoughts generate positive feelings and attract positive life experiences. So when I show you what has been found to be um, characteristics of successful mentors, I could also just ask, you know, who do you want to be? Who do you aspire to be as a person? And how can mentoring really help you personally? And so um, based on the literature um, that uh, I have referenced on this slide, these are the characteristics of successful mentors. So available, approachable, altruistic, generous, sharing, supportive, good listener, honest, compassionate, passionate, knowledgeable, gives feedback honestly, patient, efficient, honest, a role model, and respectful. So I think as we work to become good and effective mentors, we're working on really positive personal qualities that can um, help us. Um, what are some outcomes um, for mentors and successful mentoring partnerships? What does this do for the mentor? Well, um, mentors have satisfaction in sharing expertise with others and a sense of gratification in helping mentees. It allows for collaboration and exchange of ideas. And it can re-energize your own career and expand your professional networking through your mentee. Mentees also provide insight into new ideas. And as we do active listening and questioning and, and encourage our mentee to explore, we're learning from them as well and from their perspective. We may also learn new technologies, new developments, important features of the next generation. When we're mentoring um, those that are younger than us, we're learning from them um, a perspective in life that we may not have ourselves. And again, from the literature, some of the benefits to mentors is personal satisfaction, sense of contribution and accomplishment, revitalized interest in our work, and exposed to fresh ideas and new perspectives. Next, I just wanted to share some of the stages of mentorship. Um, and our next quote, the key to being a good mentor is to help people become more of who they already are, not to make them more like you. So I, um, I should keep this in mind with my children. <laughs> so the mentoring relationship life cycle. Um, this shows us on, uh, on the two axes, the intensity of learning and value added over time. And so you can see in the very beginning of our mentorship relationship, we're building rapport and setting direction. And then after that, we really have that foundation to really increase the learning and value. And at some point, that mentoring relationship winds down um, and uh, completes. And we, we want to have some closure about that. Just another way of looking at the mentorship life cycle in this um, three phases. So that first phase of building rapport, setting the contract, um, which is really clarifying the expectations for the relationship. And the phase two, that productive phase of um, directing, direction setting, making progress. And then the phase three, that maturation and closure aspect of the mentoring cycle. So with the first phase, when we're building rapport and contracting, um, that's really the, the foundation for our successful relationship. And I'm going to talk more about contracting in just a minute, but that ha happens often in the very first meeting. And sometimes that first meeting, if you can set aside even a longer period of time to do these two things will really be helpful and um, the future meetings. In the phase two, um, really we're working on our, our relationship aspects of it. And with any relationship, there's those developmental aspects to it. Um, we're working on current things, thinking about the future with our mentee. And then um, recognizing that that relationship will change over time uh, in phase three. 
So back to the first meeting. So what should object objectives um, be for that first meeting? I think the first meeting when you're meeting with uh, uh, your new mentee or your new mentor is really establishing rapport. It's getting to know each other. And that may be, if you have enough time, you know, half of the meeting, really just learning about each other, your, um, what do you have in common, what are your experiences in life, what are the values that you um, that you have? What do you feel passionately about? And really doing as a mentor, doing some active listening um, with your mentee, um, sharing your relevant social career history, um, helping the mentee focus, prioritize their personal objectives, and developing the contract, um, setting up your future meetings, and developing an action plan for the next meeting. So with building rapport. Um, we as physicians have a, an advantage in this part of our mentoring relationship because we've learned how to build rapport with people we're meeting for the first time um, through our work as physicians. But it really, um, you know, is showing interest in that person, asking questions, um, finding that common ground. A large part of rapport is that mutual relationship building of trust, um, focusing on each other, allowing empathy into our relationship with each other. Congruence, acknowledging what our mentees' um, goals are. Again, the mentee is in charge. And empowerment, our goal is really to help them become strong and independent and achieve their goals and to do that as um, soon as possible. So during the mentoring session, some common themes that often come up are in work, um, how to advance, how to find resources, building a network, people, conflicts, communication skills, feedback, balance, work life and relationships, and then stress and burnout. And in, um, there are different uh, ways to go about mentoring. So today I'm talking about this one-on-one -on -one mentoring between the mentor and the mentee. But um, I also just want to mention that there are very effective group models of mentoring where um, uh, I think this has been actually written recently about in annals of women in neurology having groups of mentoring, women in neurology group. And um, it can be a really helpful way to um, cover all of these themes in a group mentoring session. So in our one-on-one -on -one, um, mentoring sessions, we want to really try to have some sort of agenda. I think as with anything where we want to be effective and efficient, having an agenda can be, can be helpful. Um, to focus on issues, try to get under the surface of them. A good mentoring meeting has sort of stretched both the mentor and the mentee. There's been some progress made. We've got a strategy for next steps and we've both learned something. Now, as part of having that structure around our mentoring, um, relationship, it's often helpful to have a mentoring contract. Uh, and so we can, I'm going to share with you a few ways to create a mentoring contract. We do this in teaching often too, with, in small groups of students, we'll talk about forming a learning contract. It's basically to make sure, although there's some aspects of the relationship that have a lot of informality to them, that there is a shared um, understanding of what the relationship is all about. And um, the next quote, a mentor is someone who allows you to see the hope inside yourself. Our mentoring contract is a clear working agreement. It's the foundation of a productive learning relationship. What is the shared understanding of what mentoring is all about? I want to clarify basics and boundaries with each other. So some basics and boundaries. Um, how often will you meet and for how long? How and where will you meet? How long will that mentoring relationship last? What do you do if you need to cancel a meeting? How confidential will it be? And I think, you know, in, in mentor-mentee relationships, there are um, a variety of, of confidentiality. I think it's, it's good to make that very explicit with one another. Um, in some mentor-mentee relationships, there's actually a written record that's kept of it. Other times, you know, we it's completely confidential, but I think it is worth being explicit about that. Are there um, 
Will you identify yourselves as mentor and mentee? If you are at a meeting together, the mentor, will you say, oh, this is Dr. So-and-so, my protege, my mentee? Um, or is that something that you might not be so open about? Are there any potential conflicts of interest? Um, might you be on a grant review committee or on an editorial board? Something that might come up that you would just want to make explicit in the beginning. And what will you do if it's not working out? Uh, it's, and I think it's helpful to talk about that at the beginning when, when of course, it's, it's working out. It hasn't even started yet. But um, sometimes mentors and mentees just don't click. And it's nobody's fault. It's just not the right fit. And um, what will you do if you if you feel like you're having some challenges there? I'm not going to go. The next slide here is uh, I just wanted to share with you. You'll have it as a as a reference from this presentation. But I thought this was interesting to think about diagnosing and treating mentorship malpractice. And so you may know um, somebody who's had a negative mentoring relationship, or you yourself may have been in this situation. But I thought it was really nice that somebody actually took this and put it in a table. And uh, if any, it, at the very least, it helps people know who've been in these negative relationships. They are definitely not alone. And um, also gives you some potential countermeasures, such as uh, if we just look at the first one, the hijacker, which um, you know is uh, always sort of taking credit for the work of the mentee. What are the potential countermeasures? Quick and complete exit. There's no way to protect yourself in this relationship. So, um, you know, I think maybe a, a handy reference um, to keep in mind. So going back to the contract, um, we want to uh, define what the mentee's expectations are, what the mentor's expectations are, the logistics for when, where, how long, um, the research has shown that um, any less than four meetings a year are not as effective as more than four. And so trying to schedule at least six meetings over the course of the year, I think, is, is a good practice because probably you'll end up canceling a couple. So you might end up with four meetings. Um, but uh, it's, it's just sort of a helpful framework. And then are you going to offer some emergency contact? Um, and I think that really depends on the type of relationship that you're setting up. But you may might provide your cell phone and, and say, you know, if there is anything that comes up, feel free to, you know, text me um, anytime I'm here for you. Or you might some, set some boundaries to that, but um, something worth thinking about. You can make your contract um, you know, very explicit. I'm going to show you an example of a mentoring contract um, and uh, just goes through some very specific questions. Or you can just talk about this and then send an email, um, just the email showing that you're both on the same page. So um, the next step in thinking about our mentorship is to think about the organization of the meeting and really planning before and after the meeting. So um, I like this quote from uh, John Steinbeck, and now that you don't have to be perfect, you can be good. So for the mentee, five reflective questions prior to the first meeting. And what is it you really want to be and do? What are you doing really well? And what's helping you get there? What are you not doing well that is preventing you from getting there? What will you do differently tomorrow to meet those challenges? And how could your mentor help? After you've had a chance to meet at the end of the session, you can discuss what has been helpful and what hasn't during the session. Again, this is getting to that feedback. Do the feedback in real time. It's a way that you can both develop that relationship and learn from each other. Suggest any ways that you can improve future sessions. Um, and that feedback is going to help those future sessions be more effective. And make sure you have the next session scheduled, ideally the next two to three sessions. You know how our calendars are, and um, scheduling is often the greatest challenge in meeting with people. A 
after the meeting, the mentee um, can summarize the session and they agreed action plans and send an email to the mentor within three days of the session. Uh, that email can ensure that there's something to look back on when you come to the next session and it provides an opportunity to, for you both to check and make sure you're agreed and understood the next steps. And then after the meeting, the mentee will work on their action plan. Now often we are um, uh, mentoring at a distance. And so distance mentoring, we're using email. Again, that email can be used to help clarify the goals um, and the agenda and the logistics and to keep in contact. But um, it's much better to use a phone call um, if there's something critical, complex, um, we really need to share about somebody else's behavior and exchange sensitive information, uh, definitely stay away from email. And when you're doing um, communication over, whether it's over video or phone, really listening for those nonverbal cues, um, I think that's super important over the phone. Um, where you can't see somebody's facial expression and you're really listening for those pauses and change in tone of voice to, to help you know where to probe a little bit more. Um, push for specific information, clarify the meanings, um, ask questions, summarize those agreements. And then for uh, the last tip for this mentoring relationship, I'd like to say just celebrate milestones. And this is something um, I find really helpful in my workplace. You know, there's the email that goes out really um, celebrating people's accomplishments. That also happens in, uh, you know, in the Facebook group where um, there's shout outs and, and sharing of um, success. Share your own milestones, share that of your mentor, share that of your mentee. Celebrating those milestones is a really helpful part of the overall mentoring process. And then um, just what is the mentor-mentee relationship? We're learning from each other, collaborating, sharing, and connecting. And at the bottom, I have my email address so that if you would like to reach out over email um, after this presentation or any time, I'd be happy to correspond with you over email. And I'm going to um, just, if you had a um, question that you um, sent in here, or if you have a question you want to unmute yourselves, um, please feel free to do that as well. Divya Singh here. I just wanted to know, is there a way that we might be able to avail of the slides afterwards? Um, the, uh, the presentation is recorded on the Blue Jeans, which will have the slides, and I'm happy to share the slides. I just have to figure out how to do that. So um, okay. I'll see if I, can, if I can work with the organizers to make that happen. And then if um, you want to just send me an email, I would be happy I will do to that. copy of the slides too. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I wonder if I'll just ask, um, you know, there's a good number of people on the call. I, I don't know how many of you are able to um, send in a question or um, to unmute your microphone and um, just ask a question. But I'm, uh, I went over some, you know, just tried to distill some tips about the mentoring relationship. But I think we all, it's like any relationship. We've all had different experiences. And if somebody has something that they want to share um, that they have found to be additionally effective, I think this is a great forum to, to share some other tips on um, being an effective mentor.